The first time I ever met General Eisenhower was in 1964. He had asked me to come to his office in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania to talk about being the editor of his papers. And we talked through the day. And at the end of the day, he leaned back in his chair and he said, I see that you come from New Orleans. Did you ever know Andrew Higgins? I said, no, sir, Mr. Higgins died the year before I moved to New Orleans, so I never knew him. And Eisenhower said, well, that's too bad. You know, he's the man who won the war for us. I mean, that's an awfully powerful statement to come from what a source. And he saw that look on my face, and he immediately said, no, that's absolutely true. If it hadn't been for Andy Higgins, we would have had to change the whole strategy of the war. We couldn't have gone in over an open beach. This country is at war with Germany. This was their final tower. And the tell the dagger has struck it behind into the back of its knife. The Germans had defeated the French army. They had conquered Norway. They had conquered Denmark. They had conquered Belgium. They had conquered Luxembourg. They had conquered Holland. Italy was their partner. They were way deep into Russia. The whole of Europe belonged to Germany. And if Hitler was going to be prevented from taking control of the world, there had to be an invasion. The Anglo-Americans had to get troops ashore into France and start driving towards Berlin in order to defeat the Nazi army. In 1939, the U.S. military had a total of only 18 landing boats and its fleet. They weren't thinking they were going to need amphibious craft. Had the war not come, Higgins would have been a very successful small boat builder in the South. But because the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, Higgins became an international figure. He was a small town boy from Nebraska who had been interested in boats as a youth. When he came to New Orleans, he didn't have a lot of money when he decided to open his own timber business. So he couldn't get the expensive hardwood tracks that were on dry land, but he could acquire tracks along the river that flooded. It, but in order to get in and get the timber out, you had to have a way to float it out. And the average boat could not pull the logs out. It couldn't go in the shallow water. And he came up with a very shallow draft boat that could go into the swamps, that could haul the timber out, it was a matter of necessity. He had the most amazing imagination and also foresight. Many times he would come into the drafting room and say, I had a dream last night. I want you to make a sketch of it. Higgins first contacted the U.S. Navy in 1934 about the Eureka landing boat, which was simply a, a spoon-billed bow boat. It was all the things that were going to be needed in the future for a landing craft. Landing boats, when they hit the beach, had to be able to pull up on the beach, had to be able to retract. The propellers couldn't be damaged. The boats had to be able to jump the sandbars. They had to be able to go over obstacles in the water. And this is the same type of thing that they took from the Louisiana swamps to the beaches at Normandy. The Eureka itself had a slight problem. When you had soldiers with heavy packs and guns, they would have to jump over the side. One, it was cumbersome, and two, it was time consuming. So they modified an existing boat off the production line and uh, cut the bow off and rebuilt it so you could put a ramp on it. Now we can debark with men and equipment from this boat, and not only can we carry men, but we can carry small vehicles such as a Jeep. The Bureau of Ships assumed that they had the best designers in the world. They assumed that their people were trained in the best military academies in the world, that their people knew what the Navy was going to need. There was a gang of people in the Navy Department who thought they could design boats, and uh, they couldn't. The Navy has never yet designed a good small boat. <laughs> it took the Marine Corps and the Army to say, listen, we want our guys to land in the best possible boats and have the best possible fighting chance. And those boats are the Higgins boats. They're not the boats designed by the Bureau of Ships. And they just didn't like the idea that here this boat builder was telling them what to do. They wanted their boat, their design. And he was so rough that, that he didn't hold his tongue. And he, he made enemies out of these people. The South was a place that you didn't look for a military designer. Higgins was a little boat builder that had a plant on St. Charles Avenue that wasn't on water 
Now, he was an Irishman. He was boisterous. He never took no for an answer. He tended to knock down doors that got in his way. He was arrogant, and he was brash, and in many ways was his own worst enemy. And he tended to tell people what he thought, which tended then to isolate him from certain people, especially the military brass and admirals in Washington. He worked so hard. He fought so many battles, not on the battlefield, but at, at home. So many disappointments, his bouts <laughs> with the Navy about the different boats. I knew one side of him where the war effort and the business knew another side of him. And I hear about this hot-tempered Irishman, and I knew such a different side of him with his love of the family and the quiet times that it was hard to kind of put them together, but uh, he was a great man. On Sundays, he would have the whole family over and the boys would bring all of their children and we'd just have a big family dinner. They had this huge table and everybody sat around the table. When the children, when the grandchildren were still there, they would do magic tricks, and they would do incredible things, things like with cigarette through the table, and I mean, incredible. Houdini should have been scared. With our family, everyone was involved, all four of the boys. He would tell my mother and me, he'd say, let's go for a ride. And we always knew that it was a ride to all the different plants, because he had to check up on everything. We would have to wait in the car while he would go through all the plants. The men in the office were more of a big family to him than just workers. His door was always open. Even though he was head of the company, if you had a problem, you could go in and see him. He had the ability, the rare ability, to be able to talk to the welder, to be able to talk to the dock worker, or to be able to walk into Franklin Roosevelt's office and hold an articulate conversation with Roosevelt. And that's what's made him so great, because he could bring all parties together. He was a man without prejudices. He had the whole of New Orleans working for him. And they all worked on building this Higgins boat. And whether they were old or young, male or female, black or white, they all got paid according to not the color of their skin, or not what their name was, but what they did. So the women got the same pay as the men. The blacks got the same pay as the whites. Now, that was unheard of in America in 1940. He was more important in 1944 to the state of Louisiana than the combined rice and sugarcane crops. And one out of every five people employed in manufacturing in Louisiana was employed by Higgins Industries. Everyone in New Orleans either worked at Higgins, their neighbor worked at Higgins, had a relative that worked at Higgins, or had a friend that worked at Higgins. In the 1930s, Higgins was a small plant, 30 to 50 people on St. Charles Avenue. By the height of the war, Higgins employed 20,000 people, and he had eight different locations in New Orleans. So I think that many, many people that uh, worked in the war plants were doing it because they thought that, that they were doing something to contribute to the country. It was that general attitude at that time. And they knew that what they were doing was critical to the war effort, and they knew that this war was critical to their whole way of life. If we lose the war, everybody's going to be going around zig highly. In September of 1943, 92% of all Navy craft were either designed by Higgins or built by Higgins in New Orleans. At the Higgins yard, they were working 24 hours a day. At the shifts, men were working or women were working 12-hour shifts. And they were doing it six and sometimes seven days a week without any let. I mean, things that would be unheard of going into the 21st century. It were done as a matter of course. Well, at the City Park plant, they moved a boat every hour, so in a 16-hour day, they produced 16 boats. The boats were moved from City Park plant over there to Bayou St. John by rail to uh, put them in the water and test them. You don't have time for the paint to dry on the boats, really. So actually, they were painted as they were moved out of the plant. All the boats were taken out in the lake and run through a, a routine checkout to make sure that they were satisfactory. Higgins was building a world-class product par excellence that was critical to winning the war. 